Mary and Tony just said, that when there is concentrated adversity, the likelihood of poor pregnancy outcomes and poor child health and development and intergenerational poverty are increased. And we wanted to learn whether we might be able to prevent these health and developmental problems and interrupt the, the intergenerational transmission of poverty through working with families at the very earliest stages of human development. Um, we work with women having their first pregnancies. And we do that because women are going through very significant uh, changes in their roles and their underlying neurobiology that is evolutionarily shaped to uh, help all of us as human beings uh, complete our responsibility of protecting our children. And we, there is reason to believe that intervention at that particular point in human development can alter uh, neurobiology and competence in fulfilling that, that responsibility of, of protecting our children. Um, we think that one of the reasons the program has produced consistent effects is that we've been always trying to be clear about what the nurses are charged with uh, with doing and how they go about helping parents uh, protect themselves and their children. And I think that the core in all of this is, um, is that we as human beings have this really deep primal instinct to protect our children and the nurses are actually <coughs> activating and providing support for what is deep inside of us. I, I was talking to uh, Beth and, and uh, Sylvia, um, the, the nurse, the mother, prior to this session, and uh, Sylvia's, or Beth's comment to me was that, um, you know, I have, I have uh, Sylvia here with me, and she makes me look good because she's got all of this, this drive to, to do well. And I think that what, what strikes me after doing this work for now 40 years is that almost every mother in the country going through this experience is almost desperately uh, committed to protecting herself and developing and protecting her baby. And that's a very powerful force that if a pro a properly uh, leveraged can really, we think, make a huge difference <coughs> in our society. And part of it is that the nurses, the way nurses go about doing this is that they emphasize mother's commitments to their children and the things they're doing well as opposed to things that they're not doing well. And that creates a sense of hope and it creates a sense of efficacy in managing life's challenges, which we think is crucial for the success of any of this kind of work. The nurses have three major goals. The first is to help women improve the outcomes of pregnancy by improving their prenatal health and behavior. And the second is to improve the child's subsequent health and development by helping parents provide common care of the baby early in life. And the third, which relates most directly to the focus of today's briefing, is on helping families become more economically self-sufficient by helping mothers develop a vision for what life might be like and to start making choices that align what they feel and want very deeply inside themselves with respect to completing their educations, finding work, and among other things, planning the timing of subsequent pregnancies. Because planning the timing of subsequent pregnancies has a, a very strong bearing on mother's abilities to protect the first child, but also to complete her education and to find work or to make move up in the career ladder. Having a, a rapid success of pregnancy interferes with mother's own educational achievement and, and, and workforce achievement because rather than moving up from working at the counter in, in, in some uh, uh, food setting and becoming an assistant manager, they have to go on pregnancy leave. And that interrupts the process of, of um, of uh, achievement economically. Now, we've tested this program in three separate randomized controlled trials over the last 40 years. And we've done this uh, because, honestly, I wasn't sure that this program was really going to work. 
the nurses in our first trial would say to me, you don't really trust us. And I, and I said, well, we do. We need, to, we need to really put this intervention to rigorous test. And so we, we held off for 19 years in conducting research before we offered the program up for public investment because we wanted to make sure that the evidence was strong to support replication in the public arena. But the first study was conducted with a primarily white sample in a semi-rural community in upstate New York, uh, uh, Chemung County, New York. We registered 400 families in that trial. There was diversity, if you want, in levels of risk. And um, the benefits were uh, quite striking, actually. And many people said to us, when they saw those findings, gee, you've got a program that works, you need to make it more widely available. We took the position that we ought not to do that because we needed to know whether the program would produce corresponding effects in a major urban area with minorities. So rather than offering the program up for public investment, we invested in a new study in Memphis, Tennessee, with a very, uh, a very at-risk, high-poverty uh, sample. 85% of the mothers who enrolled in the program were at or below the federal poverty line guidelines of registration. The findings, in broad scope at least, replicated. And uh, many people said to us, oh, gee, well, you know, this, this program based on nurse home visiting um, uh, shows promise, but we can do, you, should, we, you would get better results if you hired people from the community to do this kind of work. Well, if you look at the results of uh, scientifically controlled studies and programs that hire people from the, the community to do this kind of work, the effects are much smaller. In fact, some people have said sober. So we felt, well, maybe it's the, the effects can be more, more pronounced if, you, if, the, if the people hiring the paraprofessional workers have a better program model to follow. So we conducted a third study in Denver in which we had both nurses and paraprofessionals follow what was essentially the same program model and to compare them to a randomly assigned control group. And basically, what we found was that nurses produced effects that were twice as large and more enduring than those uh, followed by paraprofessional visitors. Now, these are the findings that we have the greatest confidence a program can affect because we've seen these findings reproduced in at least two of the three trials with different populations, living in different contexts, at different points in, in U.S. social and economic history. We know that the nurses can help women improve their prenatal health, especially cutting down on the use of tobacco during pregnancy. We see significant improvements in women's diets. We see significant, we see significant uh, and replicated effects, by the way, on hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. We see significant reductions in children's injuries revealed in the medical record, and especially injuries for more serious uh, uh, causes. And that relates, by the way, to the, the program's effects on child maltreatment, which I'll talk about in, in just a moment. We see significant and consistent effects across trials in children's early language development and cognition, and now we see these effects on, on school achievement. But these effects are, are limited to, these, uh, to children born to mothers who have lower what we call psychological resources. They, they have their own intellectual functioning has been related. They have higher rates of depression and anxiety. They have limited sense of control over their, over their life circumstances. And so what we find is that in children born into households where, the mother, where mothers are least capable of, of protecting their children from all of the sources of adversity, in the control group, children suffer both in terms of injuries, in terms of maltreatment, in terms of um, uh, compromised uh, cognitive and, uh, development and, and academic achievement. Not so when those mothers or those families have a nurse. Uh, we see consistent effects on uh, reductions in children's behavioral uh, problems at school entry. Significant reductions across trials in children's reported depression and anxiety. We see significant reductions in children's use of substances in early adolescence. We see significant and consistent effects on mothers' own behavioral impairment due to their use of substances. We see consistent effects on, on 
the rates of, of short interpregnancy intervals, and we see significant effects on children, uh, on, on families, uh, use of welfare, TANF, uh, food stamps, uh, Medicaid. Now, I want to go and elaborate this just a little bit. We see significant reductions in the rates of state-verified reports of child abuse and neglect in the, over the first 15 years of the first child's life in the Elmira trial. And that represents about a 48 to 50 percent reduction between the control group rate and the, uh, the blue uh, bar shown on this slide. The group at the, at the yellow bar shows the rates of, for, of child maltreatment for a group that was exhibited by nurses during pregnancy alone. These effects are more pronounced in households where the mothers are poor and are um, and were unmarried at registration. And, be, and that's because we see higher rates in the control group. It's, it, 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 that tells us, among other things, that we need to focus these, these resources in communities and families where the, where the rates of poverty and social disadvantage are most pronounced. But we also see that the impact of the program on child maltreatment, the 50 or so percent reduction we see overall, or the 89 percent, reduction that we see for the more, uh, the more disadvantaged segments of the population is great, but we also need to learn for whom are we not working. Because all of these interventions have, have um, underlying complexity. There are some segments of the population for whom these interventions work well, others not so well. And, this, um, and that should be taken on board and used as a, as a as a source of guidance for figuring out how to make these interventions more effective. This slide, published, you know, um, some time ago in the Journal of the Medi uh, American Medical Association, reported that the impact of the program on child abuse and neglect in the Elmira trial was attenuated in households where there were moderate to high levels of intimate partner violence between the mother and her partner. I mean, so that gives us clues. We need to do more work in, in addressing end of the partner violence in this program. We also see that there were significant reductions in both maternal and child crime by age 15 and 19 for the program overall. But this slide shows us that the impact on crime was more pronounced for girls than for, for, for males when we looked at uh, the second half of, that, uh, of adolescence. We don't know why. Uh, when we look at children's intellectual functioning, there's a, there is a, uh, uh, an impact in our Memphis trial on, on cognitive, cognitive functioning that's more pronounced among children born to um, um, mothers who have what we like mentioned before, low psychological resources. We see oh, uh, by age 12 that there is a significant improvement in directly measured uh, math and reading achievement, but it's limited to children born to, to mothers with low psychological resources. We see this significant, significant reduction in tobacco, alcohol, marijuana use at, at, age, uh, in, at age 12 in the Memphis sample of children. We see corresponding reductions in, in children's depression and anxiety. We see over this 12-year uh, period in, in the Memphis trial uh, significant reductions in families' use of TANF, uh, food stamps, Medicaid, with corresponding reductions in costs to government, resulting from families' improved, mother's own improved economic self-sufficiency. This slide shows the rates of uh, mortality in children in the 15-year period following the birth of the first child. These these are these this is rates of death for, for preventable causes sudden death and death syndrome, injury, and in adolescence, homicide. What you see here is a significant reduction in preventable mortality in the children in this first two-decade period following the birth of the first, first child. We would never have predicted this because we think that the rates in, of death in the U.S. general population is very low. And, um, but we discovered this. And so we reported it, and uh, what's, what's uh, 
What's also striking is there are corresponding reductions in maternal mortality over the same two decade period. And for, the, for maternal mortality, these deaths are, the reduction is for all causes of death, but they're particularly pronounced for those things that we would call external causes of death. They include suicide, drug overdose, uh, overdose injury, and homicide. So we think there's something going on here, and we think that this finding is not likely to be replicated in, in populations where the rates of adversity are lower. Memphis, these, these findings come from Memphis, the rates of poverty and social disadvantage in the neighborhoods in Memphis where we sampled are off the charts in terms of social disorganization, poverty, and so forth. And I think we have a responsibility to make sure that this intervention in particular is focused on those communities and families who need it the most. Um, and the effects of this is what I reported earlier in, on the Denver trial. You need nurses, and you need nurses to do this kind of work because pregnant women are concerned about their own health. And, and they trust nurses to be able to address what this back pain means, what labor and delivery are going to be like, what's care of the fra fragile newborn going to be like. Nurses have that uh, uh, natural authority to be able to address those, those issues. And one of the things we found is that uh, in our Denver trial is that families open their doors more frequently for nurses than they do for paraprofessional nurses for the reasons I just said. We've taken the position that if we're going to replicate this program nationally, we need to do so in a really responsible way. You can't just hand out a, 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 a manual to nurses and say, go forth and do good work. We need to make sure that organizations and communities are well prepared to develop the program, that there is excellent education and consultation for, um, for nurses to learn how to do this kind of work well. We've built into that there are now very clear visit by visit guidelines that structure nurses work with families, but in order to be effective, those guidelines need to be adapted on a moment to moment basis to the, the expressed needs and concerns that mothers are revealing about what they're concerned about. That adaptation to the family's immediate needs is crucial to produce engagement and trust and long-term effects. We've built into the system, this replication system and information system, that aligns with the data that were gathered in the original trials, that allows us to monitor ongoing performance of the program. And we use that information to identify sites that are doing really well, where we're concerned about the performance of the site, and we use that for continuous quality improvement of the program itself. And that's allowed us to understand where things are not going for as well as we all would like. And we use that information, again, for continuous quality improvement. And we've used it as a foundation for going back to the drawing board to figure out what we need to do to make the program model itself more powerful. We're addressing it with partner violence. We've worked on, on, on revising the way nurses work with families to increase engagement, retention. We've developed a new tool for nurses to use in observing qualities of parents' care of their children in the home and, and to engage parents in, these, um, in this work so that they can feel more confident in their ability to care for their, their children. We're working on a method of, of helping nurses more effectively address depression and anxiety in the context of, of the home visits. We've developed a new tool for nurses to use and being able to sort out rigorous the degree to which families have risks and strengths, and to use that information to alter the dosage of the program. I can tell you that there are a lot of families who do really well who don't need the full dose of this program. We know this from our analysis of data from our original trials. We can make the program more efficient and effective by introducing these levels of, of uh, rigor into the clinical implementation of the program. We think that we can make the program more efficient and effective by bringing IT into the process of delivering this program in a more fulsome way. And we think that we need to really find ways of more effectively, even more effectively, working with other providers of services in the community. 
any case, that's what we have to, that's what I have to say. And I'm really um, looking forward to hearing from, from Beth and Sylvia, if you, if you feel good about doing that. So, Beth Glicker.